there, and we'll shift gears into the next uh, presentation. Uh, Doug's going to talk to us now about uh, fire in hardwood rangelands and oak, oak rangelands, and um, we'll uh, uh, have him for about 25 minutes talking about this particular topic. 20 minutes, I guess it is, for this topic. So, Doug, I'll turn it back over to you again. Thank you, Rick. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about fire. It's not a subject that I'm as uh, familiar with as regeneration and restoration, but uh, I've studied up. And uh, uh, in this particular talk, I'm going to talk about historic fire patterns uh, in California, how resources are affected, uh, talk a little bit about prescribed fire, and, uh, and then get specifically into the impacts of uh, fire on, on California native oaks and and end with talking about what we can do to prevent uh, some of the, the damage associated with uh, wildfires. Well, I think everybody who lives in California is aware that fires are a common feature of our landscape. Uh, they don't seem to happen with, with uh, consistency in that, that we seem to have some years when we have horrible problems and uh, other years when, when they're not so bad. Uh, but uh, there's certainly something we uh, have seen and uh, have to learn how to live with uh, as best we can. Well, in 2003, there was a, a series of very severe fires in Southern California. Uh, these happened during extreme fire weather, and extreme fire weather is when Fires start, they're really hard to put out, and that's their, uh, the, the weather conditions are critical. Uh, actually, the, the moisture, the fuel moisture is critical, but really weather drives a lot of these, and if you have uh, very hot, very dry, meaning low humidity, and very windy conditions, uh, when fires start, they can be uh, uh, near impossible to contain or put out, and, uh, you know, you sometimes the firemen, uh, they try to, put lines around them, but sometimes you just kind of wait and hope that Mother Nature, Mother Nature uh, changes. In 2003, these, these fires occurred uh, primarily in San Diego County, and uh, about half of that county uh, was affected by these wildfires. Well, I think we've all, all also seen uh, images of uh, the, the damage that occurs uh, following fire. This is uh, Fire, it looks like, in oak woodlands, and obviously a, a house and, and vehicles were affected, and, and the trees and the things we don't see are, are the impacts to probably pets and livestock and, and wildlife, and, and subsequently there can be some problems with erosion, and we'll talk about each of those things. Well, there is a, a way that we can look back and, and try to understand fire frequencies in the past. Uh, we can go into and cut out these uh, discs from trees, and you can see fire scars. Uh, they're a scar, uh, and you can date when fires happened. And we know from, from using this uh, method that for the fires in, in oak woodlands, at least here in Northern California, occurred naturally probably every 30 to 50 years. Now, during the Native American era, Fires were even more frequent, and that was primarily because uh, Native Americans intentionally set fires. Uh, they uh, obviously didn't want to you know, burn up the little community where they're living, but there were a number of reasons for uh, intentionally setting fires. And these uh, would be to make areas more open. Uh, they uh, were dependent on hunting for a lot of their food, and so if you made them more open, it was easier to... Uh, to see game and to hunt game. Uh, they would even use fires sometimes to herd game. They also used fires under oak trees to try to make it easier to collect acorns and to try to uh, eliminate some of the insects that can damage acorns. I mentioned the filbert worm and the filbert weevil. Uh, they also used fire for uh, producing certain materials that they needed, especially in basket mating. There are plants like uh, California deer grass or Muhlenbergii that really respond to fire and produce the shoots that were so important for uh, making baskets. So uh, Native Americans definitely used fire as an important management tool. Uh, just kind of an example of uh, uh, prescribed fire that, that 
could have been set. Of course, I doubt if they would have had that uh, tall electric pole in the top middle of the, the picture there. But we think that as a result of Native American burning, uh, certain areas of California were more open and savanna-like as shown in these pictures. Well, about the turn of the century, meaning uh, 1900, that century, there were some horrific fires in California and the United States that destroyed vast amounts of timber. And uh, there was a real uh, appreciation of the fact that wildfires can be tremendously devastating and uh, that something needed to be done. So I'm sure everybody recognizes uh, Smokey the Bear. This is, has become the symbol of fire suppression efforts, and uh, they essentially started this to try to prevent the damage to the multiple resources that wildfires uh, were taking place. And, and this program has been remarkably successful. They were able to, have been able to stop many fires that, that did start, and, uh, and this has been a good thing. But as often happens, there can be unintended consequences. And this is a, a picture in more of the pine-dominated area. This is last National Park. And uh, on the left is a picture from the early 20th century. And you can see that the trees are, you know, fairly widely spaced. It's kind of park-like underneath. There's not a lot of uh, down and dead material, not a lot of shrubs. This is same, the same exact vantage point about 100 years later with the, you know, where no fires have taken place over this interval. And you can see, a little hard to see, but there's, it's a very dense, there's a lot of ladder fuels, there's a lot of stuff on the forest floor. Uh, this is because true firs have come in and replaced uh, the ponderosa pines. True firs are very shade tolerant and can grow in these conditions. And this has created a, a situation where if fires do start, they become much more severe. They become catastrophic crown-consuming fires. And this is something we're dealing with now in California. Well, what about resources? What about other resources beside the timber? How are they affected? Here's a picture of a red-tailed hawk. And generally, birds are, are pretty well suited to survive fires. They can, they can fly away, and they can leave when a fire starts. Of course, you know, if they're sitting on a nest, there can be some, uh, some loss. but uh, yeah, fires often start in the fall, and so uh, everything is fledged, and, and they don't have a problem. Here's a picture of a ground squirrel. Like uh, uh, birds, they're pretty well adapted to survive fires. They can go underground. The ground's a very good insulator, and they can, uh, you know, come back out when the fires have passed through and often survive quite well. Well, let's talk about other animals, larger mammals like deer or maybe foxes or raccoons or bobcats. Uh, they can't fly, they can't go underground, and so their only recourse is to run away. And they certainly do this, but in very large, fast-moving fires, there can be substantial losses to uh, larger mammals like this. Well, let's talk now about erosion. This is an area uh, in the aftermath of a fire, and you can see that uh, most of the above-ground vegetation has been burned off. There are some things that are sprouting, but the, the plants that, that really anchored the soil with their root systems, many of them have been killed. And so uh, these lands are very vulnerable to erosion when uh, storms come, uh, especially in the first year after a fire. Now, the, the common technique for restoring areas after fire has traditionally been to use annual ryegrass, lolium multiflorum. Uh, it was cheap. It was available. It's a rapid germinator. It's easy to broadcast. Uh, so it's been widely used to try to prevent erosion. But, you know, there have been research in the last couple of decades that has indicated that maybe uh, this doesn't work so well. And, and maybe it would be better to use uh, native plants uh, and perennial plants. Uh, let's just look at a picture here. Here's a picture where there's some uh, annual rye. It looks like also some star thistle. And, and you can see that... Uh, these uh, maybe do become well established, but they dry out, and so they become flash fuels that could carry a future fire. They also tend to displace some of the more desirable native plants that have come in, and also they create that habitat I talked about in regeneration, which can be tough for, uh, for establishing woody plants afterwards. Uh, this is an ideal habitat for voles, for instance. 
So now there's much more interest in, in using some native perennial bunch grasses. Here is uh, Nacella pulchra, purple, purple needle grass, and this is often now uh, sown in areas that have been burned over along with other plants. So let's talk a little bit now about prescribed fire. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Los Alamos. Uh, you probably all, or many of you have heard of, there was a, a, there was a prescribed fire that was started by the National Park Service out of, near Los Alamos. It escaped and it uh, consumed uh, vast amounts of timber and all, so uh, destroyed uh, some houses so, and some other buildings. So this is uh, certainly one of the risks with prescribed fire. Uh, getting back to kind of uh, erosion, there are different things that are done to try to limit erosion. Here it looks like they've uh, broadcast uh, some hydromulch or something to try to uh, keep the soils in place. They also can put down these rolls of jute or other organic matter. And basically this is to keep uh, surface uh, moisture from, uh, you know, flowing down these and, and starting gullies and, and taking soil with it. Well, in spite of our, our best efforts, we certainly still do have erosion following fire. This is aggravated by the fact that often these fires come in the fall and the rainy season is very close behind. There was a, a tragic incident in San Bernardino County following those 2003 uh, fires where uh, uh, there was a very heavy storm and the soils weren't, you know, didn't have uh, plants to anchor them and there was a lot of... Uh, land movement and a, a number of people were killed in the tragic events in Waterman Canyon. Okay, getting back to prescribed fire, it's intentionally set. Uh, you kind of seek to mimic natural fire conditions. Uh, it also can be used to control noxious weeds, and, uh, and but, but there are concerns. I mentioned the, the problem uh, with the Los Alamos fire. There are also concerns about smoke. Sometimes you start these fires, you got to get approval from the state air quality control board and the winds change and the fire, the smoke gets blown into urban areas and that gets people quite upset. They don't like smoke. Okay, let's talk specifically now about the effects of fire on native California oaks. This is kind of a prescribed fire again at the field station where I worked. Pretty low intensity fire, burned some of the, you know, the dead and down material, maybe some of the shrubs, but really didn't do too much damage. There's another fire at the field station, uh, and you can see another low-intensity fire. It didn't even uh, burn up all the, the grass underneath this tree, but the tree looks pretty tough. Uh, probably this picture, if it was taken a couple weeks later, all the tree leaves would be, you know, completely brown and essentially would look dead. Well, here's a picture of that same tree a, a year later, the following uh, spring, and you can see it's leafed out normally. And really, this tree has sustained very little uh, damage or long-term damage or impacts. Now here's another tree. Uh, for a little bit heavier intensity fire, at least for this tree, it's uh, not much chance this tree will, will survive. Well, how do you know? It's often hard to tell. Now this tree you can probably pretty easily tell, but sometimes trees uh, don't look that damaged. Well, the area that's critical is the cambium, which is underneath the bark. Uh, if the cambium has been heated to lethal damage, then uh, the top part of the tree will die. Obviously, not all trees are created equal in this. If you have a bigger tree, it has thicker bark, it's more insulated, it's less likely to die. Likewise, a very small tree or some species like interior live oak have very thin bark, they're more vulnerable. Well, even if the top part of the tree is killed, trees will re-sprout from their base. And many of the trees that we see in California today uh, do have multiple uh, stems. The, the top part of the tree is dyed. It sends out m numerous of these new shoots. So they, uh, there's a natural attrition over time, and there may only be two or three. But many trees that we see in California are like this. They have multiple stems. They've originated after fires that may have taken place 50, 60, 100 years ago. Okay, let's talk about the fire impacts to oaks. Uh, oaks have evolved in an environment where fires have burned regularly. They're able to survive these low to moderate intensity fires if it only affects the leaves, little long-term impact. And even if the top of part of the tree uh, is killed, they're, they're able to su 
uh, sprout. Now, there is uh, some uh, theory that perhaps the changes in fire regimes have affect natural regeneration, but uh, the, the, the research is really not uh, convincing either way on that. Okay, the final subject, preventing damage from fires in the future. And this is certainly something that we're all uh, interested in and concerned about. Uh, it's more difficult today than it was 100 years ago in terms of the fact that we have moved out into the wild. Uh, this particular site is near the field station. None of these houses were here when I started working 25 years ago. But, you know, it's in that kind of urban fringe. Uh, people like living in the country. They're moving. But this creates real difficulties in trying to fight fires and in also using prescribed fire. You couldn't, you know, you would be concerned about using a prescribed fire here because you'd be afraid that it might escape and, and burn up these houses. There's also the fact that uh, aside from the, the fact that, that it's more complicated and that uh, people are living in the woods and so that makes it more difficult to fight fires, but also the, the, as I mentioned with fire suppression, a lot of these places in the oak woodlands now have more uh, combustible materials so when fires do start they're much more likely to become severe. Uh, here's a picture of uh, the of the before and after, and this is uh, an area where a lot of the combustible material has been removed, have removed ladder fuels, have made this area fire safe. After those 2003 fires, there was a new uh, bill that modified the state resources code, and now you're supposed to have areas cleared within 100 feet of your house. And, uh, and this is, uh, you know, it's a work in progress. People are doing it, but not everybody has done it. There's also a lot more interest now in, in building materials. Uh, these are some cedar shakes on a roof, very combustible. Not only is the wood combustible, but embers can get in those cracks or underneath the, the shakes and, and start a fire. So now there's much more interest in, uh, in using uh, uh, non-combustible uh, materials. And finally, uh, we're trying to become more careful about where we place houses. This is a, a fire on, on the upslope, a lot of chaparral here. And if a fire started, it would be very tough for this fire to survive, for this house to survive. So we're trying to now put, uh, trying to have clearances and put houses in places where they're not liable as likely to be impacted by fires. Well, I hope this information has been useful. Uh, we're not going to solve all the problems, obviously, but uh, we're trying to work on these things. And, and it's clear that fires will continue to be a part of California, and we just need to learn how to live, the, live with them uh, as well as we can. So back to you, Rick.